It's the Weekly Show with David J. Maloney. This week, David talks to rock and roll guitar great Mark Ford. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome to everyone at home, and I would normally say our studio audience to The Weekly Show. I'm your host, David J. Maloney. I say normally because we'd usually shoot the show before a small studio audience at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino. Uh, But we are still shooting a few more shows from home due to coronavirus concerns. Uh, We hope to gain clearance to get back to our live to tape shows real soon. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a man is suing Buffalo Wild Wings after he was pepper sprayed by a security guard. Now, in all fairness to Buffalo Wild Wings, the man did have a choice of lemon pepper, chipotle barbecue, Thai curry, or jam and jalapeno pepper spray. Don't cry. And in Fort Pierce, Florida, a woman was arrested for aggravated battery after striking and bloodying a man with a 15.6 ounce can of SpaghettiOs at a motel. Before being knocked out, the man's last words were, you guessed it, uh oh, SpaghettiOs. In Rector, Arkansas, a 22-year-old female teacher was arrested for hooking up with an underage male student. Uh, The school is providing counseling, which is good, especially for the boys who are struggling with jealousy. Oh, and a scary story out of Taiwan, where a three-year-old girl got entangled in a kite's tail and soared over 100 feet in the air for 30 seconds before being rescued. Through an interpreter, the little girl said she hadn't been that scared since she flew on Spirit Airlines. Swedish health authorities warn about a shortage of sperm donations at hospitals and clinics due to COVID. Uh, Have you seen Swedish women? I mean, if I'm going to donate sperm in Sweden, it's not going to be in a clinic. It's going to be in the back of a Volvo because I'm not about to assemble an Ikea bed. And lastly, in an 8-to-1 decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a Pennsylvania high school violated the First Amendment rights of a cheerleader when she was suspended from the squad for criticizing the school in vulgar social media posts off campus. A visibly relieved Brandy Levy said, that school went too far, and I'm glad those on the Supreme Court agreed with me. On tonight's show, we've got a true musical great and one of the world's preeminent guitarists. He's found success in multiple bands across multiple genres of music, and his catalog could make even the most productive musician blush. His time with the Black Crows has left an indelible mark on the music world, and here to talk about all that and more is the great Mark Ford. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Our featured guest tonight has been a staple of the music industry for the past three decades. His part in the story of the Black Crows, or or better yet, the Black Crows part of his story, is the stuff of music legend. Uh, Here to chat about his amazing music career, both before and after the Black Crows, and all the parts in between, is the great Mark Ford. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Mark, most of the time when I watch an interview of you, uh, the farthest anyone goes back is maybe your first bands, but I'd like to know a little bit more. Um, what was your early life like growing up? I mean, did, did you do most of that in, in Long Beach? Uh, yeah, I lived in Long Beach till I was maybe four or five, but then moved to a suburb that was just on the outskirts of Long Beach. It's called Cerritos. Mm-hmm. There's a very famous auto square there with a song and everything. Um, did, uh, what kind of role did music play in your home life? Not much. There was a stereo with some old records from you know parents' teenage years, but they weren't the type to put music on and listen to it for fun. So and then um, how did you grand- get into music? Well, my grandparents always had the radio on and my grandmother always told stories about when she sang. And there was, I think the main thing really, what it was is that my grandparents had a, about my mother, a piano when she was young, right? But but knowing that she probably wasn't gonna stick with it or assuming that that's a good chance, they bought a player piano. Mm. So as a kid, I grew up pumping the pedals on this thing. You put the, the paper spools on and watch it go and it, and the whole thing comes alive. So I've heard you say before that music kind of saved you. How exactly did that happen? And, and I guess, what did you mean mean by that? I mean, like I found my language. I found uh, 
a form of communication that made sense to me and wasn't encumbered with, with words. It, it gave me uh, a way to communicate, I guess. Do you remember a specific moment where you said, okay, this is it, music's gonna be my life? The second I got a guitar, I think. I mean, you know, I was, I, I couldn't have been more than 10 or 11 and, and I got a one, you couldn't play past the third fret, the neck was so warped, <laughs> but um, I never put it down. And it's just like, I just fell deeply in love with it. And my own personal world all of a sudden made sense. Do you remember the first show you played? Oh gosh, besides like having to get it out for the relatives and all that. Yeah. I mean, playing for my grand my great grandfather's funeral at an open casket, pretty young. That was pretty heavy, but probably a talent show at school, in elementary school, you know. Um, sweating bullets and hating every single bit of it, but realizing, wow, I've never felt that before, you know. Now, you've spent years playing for side project bands with some pretty well-known players, uh, Sammy Yaffa, Hanoi Rocks, Jack Grisham of TSOL, Mickey Finn of Jet Boy, and many others. What do you remember most about your time playing with those guys? And are there any specific memories that really stick out? Um, yeah, I mean, there were, there were a lot of fun times. Mostly it was not, you know, mostly it was all the days between them. Yeah, I was pretty single-minded and I didn't, I get music a lot more now that I didn't quite get at the time. Um, and I have a much better appreciation for all of that music now because at the time it was a vehicle for me to get to do what I saw Jimi Hendrix and Jeff Beck doing and Pete Townsend and on those videos and like, okay, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. How do I get there? You know what I mean? And that was quite honestly just the vehicles that opened up to me at the time it was the people that were playing around and I happened to be the guy that was obnoxious enough to tell everybody I was better than everybody else whether I was or not um, but I wanted it more than a lot of people I think uh, let's chat about Citadel Limited what was the story of that first band and how did that come together garage band it was it was the garage band it was the band that us friends literally rehearsed in my mom's garage and which uh had a couple of different names um and then we finally just lost the singer and became bernie tree essentially that's that's the long and short of it and and you guys got a lot of critical accolades for your self-titled record where did the sound for that album come from I mean, do you remember any any arguments maybe in the studio over the direction of the album? No, I mean, I was pretty, like I said, pretty single minded. Like I thought I saw a way at, in the Jimi Hendrix experience, like I saw a way to do it. And it was so um, understandable and so far out at the same time. It was like, well, that there's so much to find there. That's where I'm going, you know. <clears throat> and um, I think everybody saw that. There was a no brainer. It was a three piece. It was guitar driven. It was, you know, we weren't trying to hide our influences. Um, they probably sounded really fresh because of the atmosphere of the big hair metal sunset thing, which was isolating and and um that was what we were up against you know what i mean like there wasn't many places we could go play that kind of music rock real rock and roll what we thought it was so for in between you know the funny thing is like you talk about like mike Mick finn and sammy up and all of, like that band stronzo that we put together it's like every time the few of us got together and made like a fun super group we all of a sudden all had record deals <laughs> like offered and you know we'd fill the roxy and labels would offer steals and we're like we you know we all have projects that we really do care about you know like what about those like this is just for fun and you want to throw the money at this you know what I mean? so 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 out of sheer i guess serendipity you guys as burning tree opened for the black crows on your 
on, I guess, your first, I don't know, maybe that was your only tour. What was your first impression of the Crows and the Robinson Brothers? Um, well, I had been introduced to the band from a promo, uh, promo copy of the record. Um, a friend of mine who worked at a record store in LA said, man, you should hear this. Um, I, these guys are kind of doing something similar to what you guys are doing. And, um, and I put it in and went by the second song, I said, oh man, I'm playing with these guys. Like I said to my wife, I go, this guy sings like the way I play the guitar. Like, okay, I get this immediately. And so, you know, our records were kind of out. Sim, you know, they had already kind of taken off. We couldn't really get any traction. Um, and yeah, we opened up for them and um, it was pretty, uh, immediate, the connection that we all had together. Yeah. So looking back at some of their old interviews, uh, they seem to be very kind of self-aware of, of the kind of people they were and the kind of band they wanted to be. Was that, was that your impression as well? Uh, well, of course. I mean, they, half of your product is your packaging, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm really interested in a lot of things, too. But if I don't narrow it down to one area, I can lose the audience. You know, you gain some here, you lose some there. It's it's showbiz, folks. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course, they had to be. It was, it was, I don't think, I don't think my label had uh, as clear a vision on what to do with us as their label had to do with them. So was it just an easy decision for you to make? Well, there was a lot of distance between hearing the record for the first time and being asked. You know, a lot of time, a lot of gigs and a lot of hanging out and just kind of becoming friends had happened. And by the time the offer was there, I was, I was, had just been trying to get off of the, my deal with Epic because we owed so much money. Mm. They didn't know their, you know, they didn't hear the songs that we had been turning into them for the next record. And so it just looked like, well, we're going to be more further in debt and they don't have a clue of what we're doing. So please let us off the label. I was tired of trying to run that circus. And at the time I was really prepared and ready just to be a guitar player. Now, now this kind of blew my mind when I learned it. So is it true that only a few days later you were asked by Slash from Guns N' Roses to join their band, but turn them down for the Crows? Well, Bernie Tree and Guns N' Roses rehearsed next door to each other. So uh -huh. it wasn't like a total freak thing, you know what I mean? Like we were, it's LA scene wasn't that big. Um, but yeah, he called me like the Monday after I got back on Sunday for like a preliminary tryout weekend out in Georgia, you know, and like, and it was the official offer and, an official like, yes, let's do this. And then um, I was gonna go back like in a week or two or whatever and record. And, you know, he's, he just said that they had let go Izzy. And, you know, they had heard me next door all the time and thought, yeah, and I just said, man, I just literally just joined the Black Crows. And, and, and he said, well, awesome, you know, that's, that's a great gig for you, you know? And so it was all cool. It's great. So Mark, we got to go to a quick commercial break, pay the bills. Can you stick around till after the, the break there? Absolutely. Now you've said before that, uh, I guess if life would have been different and you would have taken that offer to join Guns N' Roses that you'd be dead. That's a really profound statement it seems. What, looking back, I guess, what are the differences you see between the Crows and, and Guns N' Roses that made that difference in your life? Well, I think I just resonated more musically with the Crows. I would have been um, less connected to anything important with Guns N' Roses and more inundated with crazy and money and drugs. So I know what would have happened. I would have been miserable and stoned and, and dead. 
Um, when you think of uh, the Southern Harmony and Musical Companion, what's, what's the first thing that you think of? That's something you can stand up straight and hang your, ja your jacket on. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's a solid record. Okay. It was done by a bunch of people hungry and ready to make the greatest record they could make. And it was just a good timing. And we caught lightning in a bottle, I think, on that one. You know, it was, it's a great record. Well, I mean, it went double platinum. It, it defined a, pretty much a generation of music in many ways. Uh, what was the aura in the studio while you guys were recording it? I mean, did, did any of you feel like what you were recording was about to change all your lives in that way? In our mind, everything we did was changing our lives every day. We were, we were arrogant and young and drunk. You know what I mean? Like, and... Even if we didn't believe it fully, we sure acted like it, you know, and, you know, act as if, and we acted, we all were going for it hard, and we were only in there recording for two days, and, I mean, it was done, except for some overdubs, so I remember a couple of days in the garage, literally knocking out some shapes of some songs that weren't fully done, and we went in and finished them and recorded them. It's got so many great tracks on it. Did you guys have a hunch that Remedy was going to be the most popular one, or did you guys kind of have a feeling that maybe there was another one that you guys thought liked more or had, thought had more different potential? They probably had a better idea of what was going on. Chris and Rich and the producers had one relationship, and us on the outside had another understanding. So when you when you think back to those early tours off the back of Southern Harmony. Are there any like really special kind of memories that stick out to you or any maybe venue or crowd that made a long lasting impression on you? Or does it all start to blur together after a little bit? Well, there are highlights, you know, there's the Pink Pops and there's the Rios and there's the, you know, the first tour was going to Japan. And, you know, there's a lot of amazing, amazing times. And, um, yeah, they do a little blend a little. I mean, it was a little while ago now. Now, we, when we started talking earlier in the interview, you s said about how Jimi Hendrix kind of had that influence and how that's kind of what you wanted to be. And then there are people who have said for years now that, that Chris Robinson and, and you were kind of the guitar duo of the 90s, kind of helping to define what it meant to be a guitarist at the time. Do you, I mean, do you realize how kind of special that sound is? And, or, and did you kind of realize it at the time? Because I mean, it seems like in some ways you then became a person who started influencing, you know, other people and younger generations. I mean, you know, you hope, I guess, maybe sort of that you get to be in the tradition of people that pass this thing on. We had to believe that we were worthy or we shouldn't have been there. Whether or not we were going to do it or not, that's for time to decide. And I think that, yeah, it's really cool th that um, Rich and I developed a sound together. And the only way that sound happens is when we play the, we play it together. You know, it's it's really that's something. And, and years after that, you you come together with with Rich Robinson to form the Magpie Salute Band. Um, what was it kind of like getting back? Was it the same kind of thing? Was it like just getting back and riding a bike? You know what I mean? Like you haven't, after you hadn't ridden for a while, being able yeah, to- Yeah, a lot of it is. A lot of it is because we, like you said, we you know we forged something um, and there's a lot of muscle memory built into that. And I, I play my guitar a certain way when I play with Rich. I, I, you know, you mentioned earlier producers because you were, you were, we were talking about how, you know, um, it wasn't in you weren't recognizing maybe it in real time because it was happening so quickly but maybe the redu the producers spotted it and, and i know that for many of your own records you wanted to use the studio kind of in the old way the way that it was when you first started like very analog what do you think is gained by an artist doing that well i don't think it's the analog or digital so much it's the um what analog forced you to do and the lack of tracks and the lack of choices was force you to make decisions and do the pre-work and decide. And then 
perform it together. That's anybody can do amazing things one on top of each other, but the magic only happens when people are doing it together and it's this response thing and then you have music otherwise you have songs uh, to me and so um i just tend to like to get as many people in the room as you can at you know to get it started and if all of them are there cool and make the decisions beforehand and count and go well, listening to you talk about the, the true studio experience, you've said before that, uh, I guess you said there's always tension. Can you walk us through kind of what you mean by that? I mean, has, has, and does that tension in the studio benefit? And it, it can really hinder it. It's, it's all in your head, you know, it's like as a producer, I want to get the artist as comfortable as possible. So that's not in his head that, you know, let all of the weird stuff that's pointing at you and all the microphones and all the what and the waiting and the hurry and the stop. And then we'll do it a little different. And there's all that going on. So you want to take as much of that away from them as possible. How do you pick a studio and producer to record with? And does it change based on the particular type of project because certain people have certain sounds and maybe you want a certain sound? Or do you consistently feel like, one, like you said, an opinion that you trust is one you can trust regardless of the project. To know that when I ask the guy's opinion that I like his opinions. You know, and I need that at least. He doesn't really need to know the technical side of anything, but he needs to get what I'm trying to do and know when I'm at my best and when I'm schlocking it or when it's better to leave that mistake because overall it was a beautiful moment. You know, I mean, like I'm looking for someone who is getting the vision and the communication across, not anything else. Um, is there a song either by a band that you were in or even some cover that gives you the absolute most joy to play as a guitarist? The new one. So, some are more fun to play than others, but the really the new thing or the way that sh song shows up today is is why I'm in it. Well, you know, you can't count on a song because a song may not show up very well one day, <laughs> but it, but another song turns out to be gives all of a sudden gives you all kinds of information you didn't even know was there. So so Mark, you're still I mean really. Uh, active in the music world, still touring, still creating. What is next up on your calendar and where can our audience go to get updated on what you're doing? Well, um, the regular places, I guess my website and it's everything's sort of in a tr transition right now, but um, I'll probably be making a record here soon and then in the new year. And then uh, and going out and playing it, you know. Well, Mark, I really, really appreciate you being on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Ford. Thank you. That is our show for tonight. A special thanks to Mark Ford for joining us. And a very special thank you for watching. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah.